So first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak here something about the, the work we do, the field we work in, that is mucosal <coughs> vaccination. Uh, and, and secondly, I, I would like to tell uh, Bruno is the moderator, but he has been my moderator in the lab for many years. So, in fact, I came out of his lab and he is emeritus at the moment. And so he has all the power now to stimulate the, motivate, the, the discussion even more than before. So this is the campus of the veterinary faculty in Ghent. It's, a, it's also, this is a nice place here, the Rossland Institute, but the Ghent University, the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine has a very nice campus outside Ghent. And uh, in that building we, we, we work and, and, and at the back we have the, the animal facilities. So why mucosal immunity? I think the people here, most of the people in the audience are, are specialists, so it, it's evident why you, you need mucosal immunity, because if you look at, at pathogens, almost all pathogens, not all, but almost all use mucosa to either cause disease, colonize, or to invade the host and spread in the host to different places. So if you have mucosal immunity, you can reduce the replication of your organism or prevent it from infecting the animal species. So it, it is evident. And why, why another important way is that it is in fact more friendly to vaccinate via mucosa. Not always the case, you know. I tried to vaccinate my dog intranasal. I can tell you it was not my best uh, part of it, but uh, I will tell something more about that, but in general, mucosal immunizations can be uh, friendly, more friendly, uh, human friendly, animal friendly than the injections we do. And uh, if you think of good ways to apply it, then it can be less labor intensive. Um, so I, I summarized here on this slide all the vaccines I found mucosal vaccines that are available in humans, and perhaps here and there some is missing. I did my best to be as complete as possible. But, uh, but you see here that, that the list is smaller than you would expect. Um, you see polio at the top, and, and I remember, so I also worked in the lab of uh, Maurice Pensart, and this was the first we discussed, that is the polio vaccination. And in fact, he said this is not a mucosal vaccine. You know, because it, it works like a lot of pathogens that just use the mucosa to enter and spread to different sites and induce immunity. It's not causing real mucosal immunity. So th this, in fact, is a, is, a, is, is, one, is, is a difference. But if you look at cholera, typhoid, rotavirus, influenza, adenovirus, uh, ETEC, which, is, which in fact uses the cholera vaccine, uh, they're, they're all mucosal vaccines. And what do you see uh, most are oral? Uh, in human medicine, there is only one uh, intranasal available, commercially available. And then, then the other thing you see is that they're almost all live vaccines, live attenuated of, or reassortant vaccines. There are only very few inactivated vaccines available. They're, they are available for cholera toxin. And, uh, and partly because there is an adjuvant in it, but it's not always the case. They don't all have the adjuvant in the vaccine. So that is, a, that is an interesting remark. Then, then look at, at the, the, the vaccines. I tried to do the same for the animal vaccines that I could find uh, uh, on, on, on the, in, in the literature. And you see that that was stimulating that the number of oral vaccines in the uh, veterinary medicine are increasing, especially in pigs. In pigs we have uh, different oral vaccines available, but all these oral vaccines are live, either avirulent strains or uh, attenuated, uh, attenuated strains. Uh, in, in dogs, you also have an oral vaccine available against Bordetella bronchiseptica kennel cough. And this is an oral vaccine 
that is working against a respiratory pathogen. So what is happening there? And, and of course, the reason is, that's why I told you about trying to vaccinate my dog against kennel cough intranasally. That's the reason why they developed this vaccine. Because it, I, I can easily touch my dog's nose, but when I come with, a, with this tube in the neighborhood of his nose, he reacts like crazy, you know? <laughs> so going in his mouth is much easier than going in his nose uh, or, or coming close to his nose with a, with a syringe type. So that's why they developed it. Uh, th there is discussion if this is as good as the intranasal vaccination. I've seen a study comparing both, and I, 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 I'm, I think it's not as good as the intranasal vaccination. But this one is a monovalent, and the intranasal is a trivalent vaccine. So that's also an important remark. Then you have the rabies, and the rabies is, in fact, a little bit comparable with the polio vaccine. In fact, it's not really a mucosal vaccination. No, you, 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 you uh, cause lesions in the mucosa, and, uh, and the virus can, can be transported systemically via these lesions. And then looking at the veterinary nasal vaccines, this, this is uh, not as well developed as the oral vaccines because, of course, vaccinating a pig intranasal, if you cannot spray it, it's not easy, you know? Uh, cattle, you have the IBR vaccine, and in dogs, uh, I, I know from experience, and I think most people know, that it's not always easy to do it intranasally. So intranasal is very good if you can spray it in the, in, in the environment where you have a lot of animals present. And that's why you see these mucosal vaccines in birds. You see in birds, birds is really the best studied animal species for mucosal vaccination. Best studied, I mean you have the most mucosal vaccines available. But it's really intriguing. You, these vaccines, you can, you can use them ocular, ocul oculonasal, oral. Some of them are even given via the feet, and they always work, you know. This is really intriguing. And I, I don't believe somebody really studied why this is happening, why, what is happening, what is activated, and how is the activation going in the animal, from what side to what side. Uh, that's, I, I, I don't know, but Bruno... You, perhaps you, so it's a lot of experience uh, working with this. And then the mucosal vaccines in, in fish, you have vaccines in fish, and you bring it in the water, the fish is in the water, and then it goes via the skin. But this is a, a one that is registered via insect larvae. The, the virus is replicating in the insect larvae, and the larvae are eaten and vaccinate the fish. This is a, a 2018 registered. So uh, on the market now. So you see, although mucosal vaccination, and there are a lot of pathogens that use these mucosal ways to invade the, the, the host or to replicate, uh, that replicate at the mucosa, still there are relatively few mucosal vaccines available. And, and they're, they're there are several reasons. First of all, you need to know the protective antigens. What are the protective, what, what you, what do, to what do you really need immunity? And how, which type of immunity do you need? Mostly, IgA is working excellent. If you have IgA antibodies against most pathogens, it can completely neutralize the pathogen. But mucosal IgA is limited in time at the side of the mucosa. So it easily disappears after three months. And then, of course, you have invasion and other mechanisms. Memory responses should play, play a role. Then, then the, the delivery of the antigens. You see that all these vaccines are almost all avirulent or attenuated strains. So how to deliver it? And, and there is a lot of research going on on death, vaccination, liposomes, and whatever, but I cannot find anything commercially available until now using these systems. And, and then, then you have 
the, the maternal immunity, which is extremely important, of course, when you want to vaccinate in, in, the, in the young animal, and I've seen that uh, Linda is going to talk also about that, using probably rotavirus and coronavirus models, but I, have, I, I just saw a, a brief uh, overview of, of her slides. But this is, of course, a very intriguing thing, and I think this passive immunity, we don't know it completely well, how this is working and how you can escape this passive immunity. So th these are things that are interesting, uh, interesting things. And, and now I'm going to use some slides I lent from, uh, from a good friend of me, that is Jean-Pierre Scheerlink, who is in, in the Melbourne University and who works in sheep on intranasal immunizations. And, and, you know, if you, if you see all these studies in the literature and on intranasal immunizations, you often, often see mice as a model. And you have to be extremely careful if you use mice as a model to do intranasal immunization. Because, in fact, almost everything seems to work in mice. And I will show you why almost everything seems to work, and that is not the case in other species. You see here... The, the volume they use in these immunization experiments is, is quite large. This is 50 microliter. That is comparable with 200 micro milliliter in a human. You know, that's like half a bottle in the nose of a human. This is incredible, you know. And then if you go to, to animals, this is completely comparable with humans. So it's the same amount uh, of, of uh, volumes that you use. And, and this, is, this is shows what I just meant. This is a study in which they, they add 50 microliter in each nostril of a mice of a, of a, a virus-like particle that has been labeled with a fluorochrome. And here you see when they bring in PBS in the nose, and this is what happens when they bring in 50 microliter in the nose of a mice. In fact, you vaccinate the lungs of the mice and not the nose. You never do that in, an, in another species. So if you use these huge volumes, 50 microliter, and you, you see, of course you see immune responses occurring because you vaccinate the complete lungs and probably a lot of it is ingested also. So there is a huge difference between the, the, the nasal lymphoid tissue of rodents, which you see here, rabbits, rat mice, and the, uh, the, the mammals, which you see here, the large animals, sheep, pig, and then the human. You see, we, the large animals, they all have the, this ring of wall dire, which is compromised of tonsils, which are located at different sites on the entrance between nose and the, the, the oesophagus and the larynx. Uh, so they, they form a ring. And if you vaccinate in, in, in a sheep or in a pig, you need to bring your antigen at this site. And even that is not enough to vaccinate. Uh, if you do this in mice, the lymphoid tissue in mice is at the bottom of the nasal cavity. And the mucosal tissue is very thin and leaky. So you bring in fluid and antigen, it easily reaches this lymphoid tissue, which is not the case in your larger animals. So comparing these data from a mice and bringing them to another species is really a tricky thing. And I, I can, can, can show here, this is a, a, an experiment that Jean-Pierre did in sheep, where he added an antigen, it's not a living antigen, it's just an antigen, he sprayed it in the nose of a sheep, and he followed in the draining lymph vessels the immune response occurring against this antigen. You see what the immune response is? This is the immune response. Nothing at all. Nothing happens. So if you do this in a mice, you will have the chance that you see something happening. And, and the reason he says, that this, so you, you bring in your, 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 your flute in the nose, it reaches here, this hole in, at the end, and the lymphoid tissue is located here. 
And so what will happen? A lot of this fluid will be ingested and you will not have activation of the immune system. So you need a real good interaction. Um, so th the reason is that you need interaction with the mucosa. You need, in, in, in these systems, you need the, the, the antigen to interact with the mucosa and that can happen with a live organism, of course, which replicates locally and stimulates the, 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 the immune system and then the, the antigen can be taken up. So it's much more difficult with, uh, with a death vaccine. And, and, and a, another example is what we, what we did in our lab. This is a CTA1DD. CTA1, that is the CTA part of cholera toxin. And CTA part of cholera toxin is the, is the uh, active side. So the cholera toxin has two sides. It has the B side that binds to the mucosa and the A side that is the active side that activates cyclis AMP and induces fluid loss. So it is also needed to induce immunity. And, and uh, Niels Licke in, in um, Göteborg, he used one part of the CTA site and connected it with, a, with an epitope of tetanus toxoid. And this was working very well as a, as a uh, no, it's DD, it's, a, it's I think it's, it's protein A, one part of protein A. And so th this is targeting B cells. And it works very well in mice. If you use it, you see here this, these immunizations and the immune response, IgA response. And if you add the adjuvant, you see that the, the immune response is increasing in mice. And he showed that this targeting B cells in the nose and, and activates these B cells. We did the same in pigs, used this with the antigen F4 fembria and used CTA1DD, nothing happened at all. No effect at all. And that is because afterwards, I discussed with Niels Lieke, and afterwards he said, yes, but we know the CTA1DD in mice passes through the mucosa and reaches the B cells. In pigs, this doesn't happen because the epithelium is not so leaky. So it's a much tighter epithelium and it cannot pass, and so you don't have any effect there. Okay, so, and, and, and in the studies that Jean-Pierre Scherling did, he, 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 he in, the, in the nose, he primed the nasal mucosa by injecting his antigen submucosal in the nose of a sheep. Because if he used that antigen and he didn't inject it submucosal, it didn't work. So, and here you see priming and boost responses. When did it work? It worked when he primed the animal systemically and then came with a dead antigen locally. And then he didn't need to inject, he could just add it locally. So boost responses did work. And probably because there is antibodies involved in uptake of the antigen at the mucosal sites. So let's go to the oral vaccination. So, so if, you, if we go back, intranasal immunization, yes. Yeah, so be careful with what you learn of my systems. Be aware that there are a lot of tricky things happening there that you cannot replicate in, in other systems. And so what is a general rule, if you want mucosal immunity, your antigen has to pass the mucosal barrier in one or another way. And I will tell a little bit more about that when we, we look at the oral vaccination. So you, 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 you see oral vaccination is preferred route for intestinal immunity. We, we know that very well. If we need immunity, especially in pigs in the intestinal tract, then we need to locally immunize the animal in the intestine. Then you have different possibilities. You can use live or dead vaccines. And, and if you use live vaccines, then, then, then uh, you have to be careful because they need to be virulent enough to cause, uh, to cause lesions, to activate the immune system. Uh, but they shouldn't be too virulent to and cause disease. And, and the fact that, that this balance is important, you see that, that some Avirulent 
lookalike organisms are used to vaccinate uh, animal species, which is coming up in all these oral swine vaccines nowadays. So which probably lack some virulence factors ma making them uh, too pathogenic and have uh, 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 some virulence factors that are activating the immune system and are involved in protection. So it is much more tricky to use dead vaccines uh, uh, because of course you have all these barriers, you have the stomach, you have the pH in the stomach, you have the, the, the enzymes in the gut, you have the the mucus layer that is present, the motility of the gastrointestinal tract, you have the glycocalyx, the sugar coating on the enterocytes, you, uh, uh, um, you have the distance, I will tell something more about it, which makes it uh, difficult to immunize. So you have a lot of barriers and then you have the tolerance mechanism, which is present at, at all mucosa. Uh, tolerization is an important part of the immune system and it also plays a role in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, making vaccination much more difficult. And then again, what I already mentioned, you have the H, the passive immunity occurring and, and milk antibodies and uh, systemic antibodies from the mother uh, interfere with the vaccination process. So this is a beautiful cartoon. And, and if you ha haven't seen it or you don't know it, you should look it up and keep it on your computer. I do it. Uh, I look at it regularly. It's, it's, it's uh, developed by Brandsag and Papst, uh, uh, two um, human mucosal immunologists. And Brandsag uh, dis uh, died uh, two years ago, but he was an icon. He is the first who showed that IgA can be transported from the gut to the, to, to the mucosa. So he sh showed the transportation through the enterocytes. And this is a beautiful cartoon because it summarizes the lymphoid tissue in the small intestine in different species, as well ruminants, pigs, dogs, as rat, man, mouse. And so you can immediately see the differences that are occurring. What you don't see here, and that's why I put it there, that is the length of this intestine. So you see in, in pigs when they're, they're, um, they're born, the small intestine is already three and a half meter long. And if you look here at the organization of the lymphoid tissue, then you see that the, the lymphoid tissue increases in density from the gall, the gut associated lymphoid tissue, from the duodenum to the ileum. And in pigs, it starts somewhere in the beginning of the ayunum, and then you see uh, lymphoid follicle spares patches organized. They, they, they increase in number towards the end, and then in the ileum, it's one large uh, pears patch. In humans, you almost don't have this part of lymphoid tissue. You don't have these spares patches in the ayunum, but you, you have this long uh, uh, ileal uh, pears patch just like in pigs in the in the ileum and then in sheep I think it already starts in the duodenum you have isolated pears patches and they increase in density to to the ileum so there are differences in species uh, in 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 uh, in rats you don't have this this long and mice you don't have this long pears patch in the ileum so they they stay isolated but but if you want to vaccinate, the, the concept is that you want to reach these pears patches, because I will show it later. The, the pears patch is the organization of the lymphoid tissues, the lymphoid follicles, where the immune response can occur. And above these pears patches, you have special epithelium that can sample antigens and transport these antigens uh, in, in these pears patches. And, and so we want to target this. But you see, the distance, if you vaccinate orally, the distance you have to go to reach these pears patches increases. And if you vaccinate an adult animal, the small intestine can be 15 to 20 meter long. So you have to move at least six, seven, eight meter in the small intestine with your antigen without being destroyed and released in, a, in the correct amount at the correct site. 
So that makes it, again, more complicated. But we believe that this is not the only route you can vaccinate. And I, 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 that's why I developed this, this uh, animation to show you that. So this, this part here presents the cranial part of the small intestine, where you have the enterocytes with their glycocalyx and the mucus, and you have the dendritic cells lying underneath this epithelium and the draining lymph nodes. And, and this part represents uh, mucosa, the follicle associated with the mucosa above Peyer's patches. And here you have this special M cells available, membranous cells, which have less glycocalyx, less mucus, and they can, can uh, take up the particles, particles as big as yeast particles of one micrometer until even 10 micrometer, there are pictures of, of very large particles that can be transported. And you see, so there is almost no glycocalyx and the mucus layer is much thinner at that site. So antigens easily reach the epithelium and can be taken up by the, the, the specialized M cells and reach the underlying gut associated lymph fluid tissue. And if you eat food, and that's what is happening here, then antigens of the food, they're not completely inert, you know. The, you see that antigen of the food can pass the epithelium and about 10% of what you eat, the antigens reach the underlying mucosa, reach in an immunogenic form the, the, the lymph fluid, the, the, the dendritic cells there. So 10%, not completely intact, about it's less than 1% can completely intact past the, the enterocytes. And it's, it, the 10% is digested and some immunogenic peptides pass uh, through. So they reach these dendritic cells. They, 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 they are loaded by the dendritic cells, but they are in an immature or semi-immature status. And they come in contact with T helper cells. And if these immature dendritic cells come in contact with T helper cells, then they switch to T regulatory cells. And these T regulatory cells produce then, among others, IL-10. And IL-10 is involved in, in tolerating the, 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 the antigens. So you don't get an, an uh, uh, inflammatory response against these antigens. Now let's look at the pathogen or, or pathogenated antigens, especially a pathogen, if it comes in the intestinal tract, it starts to colonize the gut. And of course, if it is a well-developed uh, pathogen, it will reach these sites in the caudal part of the small intestine. So that is one of the reasons why the lymph food tissue is located in the caudal part, because the, 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 the pathogen will reach it. So you make already a difference between non-pathogenic and pathogenic antigens. And so it reaches this site, and, the, and then it has, of course, virulence factors. It has fimbria. It can have fimbria. It can have flagella. It can have uh, uh, um, 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 uh, LPS if it's a gram-negative bacteria. It can have other, other uh, molecules that are recognized by pattern recognition receptors present on the intestinal mucosa. And, and, and such a cell, you have to see it like it's full of receptors, full of receptors that recognize, I call this danger signals. And these danger signals, if they're recognized, they activate the cells and the cells produce inflammatory signals. So these cells or these pathogens are immediately recognized by the enterocytes and start, the enterocytes start to produce by reacting with danger signals. And these danger signals, they start to attract the dendritic cells that come closer to the epithelium and become activated. And the activation, the, the, the result in, in uptake of the pathogen. Pathogens that are either sampled via the M cells or cause lesions and are transported submucosally, or these dendritic cells, due to the activation, they, they have dendrites that can enter the lumen and sample the pathogen, like you see here. So the pathogen has now activated the dendritic cells and the epithelium, and so the dendritic cell is changing its phenotype, and this mature dendritic cells, when they now activate the the T helper cells, 
then these T helper cells start to switch. In this case, it's a T helper 2 cell that produces IL-4. And this, together with the antigen, will activate the B cells. And these B cells will change into plasma cells. And the plasma cells will switch uh, their production or will have their production of IgA. And IgA will, and this is a little bit too fast, IgA will, uh, I should put it a little bit faster, you know. IgA will be secreted and then reach a receptor, the polyimmunoglobulin receptor at the base of the enterocytes and secrete it into the lumen. And in the lumen, it can neutralize pathogens, toxins, whatever is, is needed. So th this is important. Uh, you see, in this scheme, I didn't mention mesenteric lymph nodes. And there is a reason why I didn't do that. Normally, you would expect these cells migrate to the mesenteric lymph nodes, and then from the mesenteric lymph nodes, they start to migrate in the blood circulation. In the pick anyway, they immediately leave the lymph node and go in the circulation, and then they home back to the mucosa, so you get homing of cells. But there are evidence, and also we have this from our research, that not all these cells home, but that some cells stay in the mucosa, and then you also get a lateral spread of immune cells, so that there is already uh, faster mucosal immunity occurring, not by the homing way, but by spreading in the mucosa. And Niels Licke, the, this guy that works in mice, showed that this happens in the mice system anyway. So what do you see here? The, the big difference is, is the danger signal that you get. The, the, the danger signal is essential to induce immune responses. So here you don't have it, and you have tolerization. Here you have it, and you get immunity. And, and we believe that, that the site is playing a role. And there are studies in, in mice that say, yes, you, you, this cranial part, the duodenum, is more involved in tolerization, and the caudal part is more involved in immunity. But, but then there are studies in which they knock out the pear's patches, and they can induce immunity anyway in these mice. And then there are studies that show that the pear's patches are really ne needed to induce tolerance. And so everything depends, I think, on the antigens you use and the environment you create. And there are different possibilities to reach the same goal. And that is uh, important to have it in your, in your mind. So if you orally vaccinate, we believe that, that you, you, if you trigger via the, pairs, via the M cells the pairs patches, then you can induce a good immunity, what you can do with, with life. Uh, life uh, uh, antigens, but you can use also that material, but then you need to include danger signals, and, and you, ha you need to trigger it in one way or another to the M cells, or if you use soluble antigens and you target the epithelium, again, you need danger signals and you can induce immunity. So if you target, you need to activate the enterocytes in one or another way. So the interaction with the epithelium is really essential and the stimulation of danger signals is essential. And if you look at this, the rare soluble antigens that it can induce mucosal immunity, you have the cholera toxin, interacts with the mucosa. You have the LT enterotoxin, interacts with the mucosa. There are other toxins that interact with the mucosa induce immunity. And I will show you that also the F4 fimbrial antigen we use and can immunize, interacts with the mucosa and stimulates some mechanisms in the mucosa. So, yes? In, in those cases, uh, the antigens don't transit those uh, through the epithelial cells? Yes, mostly, mostly yes. Yes, mostly yes, but you know, the cholera toxin, the mechanism of cholera toxin after so many years is not completely known yet. It comes in the, in the, in the enterocytes, activates uh, cyclizyme and pay production in enterocytes, but it also, you've, you can also find it on B cells and T cells. It activates any, any, any cell type it can reach. 
So probably some leak to the, the barrier and reach the, 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 the because. But transitosis, if you can have transitosis, this is, of course, an advantage. But for cholera toxin, I cannot remember that I've seen that transitosis is occurring. So F4 fimbria, that is the fimbria of enterotoxigenic E. coli, responsible for weaning diarrhea in piglets and neonatal diarrhea. And, and so many years ago, Bruno and I, together with a PhD student, student started to work on these F4 enterotoxigenic E. coli. And I would like to understand the immune responses that occurred in the mucosa. And, and, and the immune response we, we, we tried to, to study was first against the fimbria. And there was a reason why we did that. The reason was that you have piglets with a receptor for these fimbria, and you have piglets without a receptor. And we were interested to know what the difference would, what difference this would make for the immune response. So we gave these fimbria purified to the piglets, and we noticed that these piglets developed uh, an immune response. So the we, we afterwards uh, showed that these fimbria are taken up, they interact with the epithelium, and they can be transported through the enterocytes and reach underlying tissue. They activate the B cells, and you can already see this four days after the administration. In the Pears patch, you see IgM antibody uh, secreting cells that produce antibodies against the fimbria. And then after f seven days, they appeared in the mesenteric lymph nodes, and then they spread in the blood these antibody-secreting cells. So they, they followed the homing pattern. But there was a first peak in the pears patches at day four. So a peak in the mesenteric lymph nodes at day seven. Then they peaked in the blood at day nine. And at day 11, we saw the IgA antibody-secreting cells appearing in different tissues, also in the spleen, in the, in the uh, pears patches, and, uh, and, and we saw we could detect IgA in the lumen in the gut. So there was a, a process, and it showed that via this route, you could not only induce local immunity, but you could also induce systemic immune responses against these fimbria. So we, sh we showed by injecting ligated loops with the antigen, with what was uh, labeled with fluorescein, that, and this is the, the, the epithelium, the follicle-associated epithelium above a pear's patch, and, and the, the dotted line presents the lining of the lumen, so of the enterocytes, this is the lumen, and the red is cytokeratin 18, and people who work with the PIC, they know that cytokeratin 18 allows you to recognize M cells. They are strongly expressing cytokeratin 18 in the pic. So these strongly expressing cells are M cells. And here you see the fimbria. And this is a confocal image. So the fimbria appear after this is 30 minutes, I think, appear in the enterocytes, in M cells, and, and whatever cell they reach, they are taken up and, and come in, in the lumen. And so we were interested to know which, what was involved in that, and we, we, we identified that aminopeptidase N, which people here in the audience probably know, aminopeptidase N was involved in interaction with these fimbria, which you know from the coronaviruses, uh, uh, which is also playing a role in uptake of these uh, viruses. And... Uh, and so we studied also the immune response, and if we add F4 fimbria to naive uh, lymphocytes, then it induces IL-17A responses, and that was very intriguing. Um, there is a publication on the IL-17 response after F4 ETAG infection, but also the fimbria can induce IL-17 responses, and, and we showed in the lab that if you add IL-17A to uh, the cell line epic 2 which is an enterocyte, a unal enterocyte cell line of the pigs, that it induces, oh, that it induces the polyimmunoglobulin receptor, uh, increases the, the expression of the polyimmunoglobulin receptor, increases defensins, increases mucin, and so we see a sort of for, we call it fortification of the intestinal barrier. So 
the, the intestine epithelium recognizes these pathogens and reacts with production of IL-17A, and IL-17A is going to close the intestinal barrier or to defend the intestinal barrier with, with uh, all kinds of mechanisms that, that enhance protection at this site. So we use now different strategies, that is the F4 Fimbria as a carrier system. The, we, we develop antibodies against aminopeptidase and then use this as a carrier system to, to, uh, to target antigens to the mucosa. We, we have done this with polyclonal antibodies and we have several monoclonals in the lab that are used to target antigens to aminopeptidase N. And we, we work also with particles which we target to aminopeptidase N. Uh, and th these particles here are yeast ghost particles that can be loaded with antigen so that we can, uh, can protect them better against uh, uh, maternal immunity. So how does it work? Uh, if you add antibodies to the enterocytes, then they bind to aminopeptidase N and they're rapidly endocytosed in the cell. And even the antibodies are transcytosed. We can detect them at the bottom of the cell, and you see here in loops injected with the antibodies. The, so here you see them binding and, and taken up by the enterocytes, and then you detect them in the lamina propria in antigen-presenting cells. And, and, and if you then immunize, this is a, a, a rabbit with a polyclonal APN antibody, and you look at the immune response in this uh, pick, uh, uh, 14 days after a primary immunization, and a primary immunization in our hands is also giving it three subsequent days. Uh, and then you see huge IgA responses occurring in, in, in serum against the antibodies that have been targeted to APN. So uh, you get really strong IgA responses. And here, this is an example of the of the of the, tar of the particles, so this, the particles we have used until now are Saramicius cerevisiae, which have been treated with acid base, so they become hollow, and then you can load them with a complex of antigen and tRNA, so uh, you can also add uh, adjuvant in these particles. Now you see the loading. And then what is also important, we think, is that the, the, the wall of these yeast particles consists of beta-glucans and beta-1316 glucans or in it immune-stimulating molecules. So in fact, the particle itself is working as an adjuvant system. And so we conjugate the antibodies on this particle. And here you see the antigen loaded in the particle the antibody coated of the particle and both, uh, so the particle, you see it is quite large. Um, and then we, we add this to uh, enterocytes and then we look at the uptake. This is in loops, injected in loops. And here you see the loop when it is injected with uncoated particles or with anti-APN coated antibodies. And you see a, a significant increase in uptake, especially in the lamina propria. And you can find clusters of particles in the lamina propria of the animal uh, in the loop where you have injected these, these particles. And we also did already an immunization experiment in animals. And this is the response of the serum antibody response 14 days after two immunizations. And then you see a significant increase in comparison with the antigen when it's given free or when it, the particles are loaded with only antigen and not targeted to the, 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 to the mucosa. So there is enhancement of immune... Yeah, how, how many minutes do I...? Three minutes. Three minutes. So there is enhancement of the uptake of the particles, but the system is not ideal yet. And I th we think that the, 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 the dimension of the particles is a, uh, is a little bit too large. We have to find a way to... To, to, to make them smaller. And, and so this is a, 
com comparing. Then what about common mucosal immunity? I think uh, when I started working in these projects on mucosal immunity, there was always the thing about common mucosal immunity. And if you vaccinate in the gut, you vaccinate all the mucosa. If you vaccinate in the nose, you vaccinate all the mucosa. But nowadays we know this is not the case. And this is a very beautiful cartoon from um, Jan Holmgren and, and Cecil Sarkinski uh, showing in a human system the link between different immune systems. And, and you see if you immunize orally, you mainly reach the gut. If you immunize intranasally, you, lead, you reach the lungs. And in humans, you can find it in the, in the, in the genito, genitourial tract. If you vaccinate rectally, you can reach the rectum and the colon. And if you vaccinate va va vagally, vagum, how you say that? In the vagum, then you, you, you stay there. Okay, and this summarizes this effect. So there is some priming at distant sites, but there is not really immunization at distant sites, except for, for the nasal to the reproductive tract and the oral, which is not mentioned here, but probably Linda is going to talk about that, and the, and the mammary immune system. So common mucosal immune system is not so common. And the reason is that, that you have uh, a combination of uh, chemokines and receptors that are quite specific for certain sites in the body. And, and so you, I, I show it just as a, as a cartoon. If you vaccinate systemically, you see the IgA plasma cells. They are attracted to inflammatory sites, and they recognize chemokine and receptors that are specific for that site. If you vaccinate in the intestine, then you have the same, but you have now CCR9, which is not present here, and you have alpha-4, beta-7, which is not present here, and you get a different localization of your immune cells. So there is a sort of, uh, of, of, uh, of focalizing the immune response. And that has also been nicely presented in a study of uh, Kunkel and Butcher in Nature Review in Immunology. So for the pigs, we know that if you vaccinate orally, you can reach the mammary gland. Um, uh, here, you, if you vaccinate orally, you can reach the mammary gland and induce very high IgA responses in, in the milk and you, uh, you immunize the gastrointestinal tract. If you vaccinate orally and reach the tonsils, then there is an immune response occurring in the milk. In my hands, as far as I know, this is much more mixed. Sometimes you have IgA, you have more IgG, but you can have both appearing in the milk. And then you also immunize the trachea and bronchi. Okay, so I, I'm now the last part about maternal immunity because Linda is, is going to talk anyway about it. I'm going to skip. I just want to, to show this slide because it's important for me. So we already organized two times a meeting on E. coli and the mucosal immune system in Ghent. And next year we're going to organize the third meeting. And so people of you who are interested in E. coli and all kind of E. coli and all kind of species from human to, to my, even mice, you know, I allow some mice talks, <laughs> they, they, can, they, can, they can come. And, and so it's how they interact and how they stimulate the immune system. And then the, some of our own results are, are the work of a lot of people. And, and, and Bruno has been the, the motivator the initiator of all this mucosal immunology research. And, and now uh, Berthe Vriend, my postdoc, is, uh, is taking an important lead in the fundamental mucosal immunology work in, in, the, in the lab. So, okay, because I have to stop, I will stop. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention.
is there a microphone or is it good? There is, there is another one here. Oh, you have one. Yeah. You have one. Okay. Are you moving around? I'll move around. Okay, Eric. Now, like you told in the beginning, the mucosal vaccines, well, mucosal vaccination, let us say, started quite a lot in poultry, yeah? Now, as we know, I'm talking about the chicken, not so much about the duck. I would, well, I don't need it. I'm going to pass this one around. I oh, yeah. yeah. I thought there was one also to be <laughs> passed around. Okay, but um, as we know, yeah, regional lymph nodes in chicken, we don't know them so much, eh? They are not. I know, I know. So all these mucosal vaccinations, where is the induction place in chicken? What is happening is that in, in the spleen? What is happening in the heart, heart or the gland? I, I, yes. Yeah. So in the eye, so the, is that the playing a major major part in this response? Well, the eye drop method exists as well. Eh? But is it really shown? Because I, I'm, no, I'm, I, I don't, I, about, I don't, to my knowledge, but I am out a little yeah. bit. I don't follow. I miss anymore. these studies. I would like to see how this is. If you add the antigen, mm -hmm. where do you get the activation? How is it migrating in the body? What sides does it reach? And, yes. and yeah, yeah, there is somebody who can uh, help us. I think. You know, when you, when you immunize the chicken um, via the respiratory tract, yes. you can see uh, the plasma cells appearing first in the lungs itself, then in the bone marrow, and after that in the spleen. So I don't think the spleen is the primary place for the chicken. I think it's all okay. locally um, in the mucosa itself. But it should and, be... And the, and, yeah. the, the correlations between blood and spleen are very strong, and the correlation between lung and bone marrow are very strong. But it's follicles then in the lung. It's, it's not a lymphoid it's, structure. It's, it's, there is a, lympho a big lymphoid structure in the lung. Which one? The bronchus associated lymphoid tissue in, in the secondary bronchi. Is that also in a young animal like that? Yeah. Or is it For developed during getting older? No, it's because already, in, it's already in, in one week old birds. But it, it really develops with age. It but develops can, with age. Yeah, but you can see the first follicles appearing around the secondary bronchi in one week old birds. Okay. Thank you. Like but I, 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 it's strange in a certain sense. We know as well that the chicken, the respiration, is going by exhalation. Eh? It's not by inhalation. Eh? Yeah. You know, the air is first going to the, mostly, air sacs. Yeah. So I expect the antigen also to go first to the air sacs and not to the lungs, because the air reaches the lungs by exhalation and not by inhalation. But so it's very strange that you find it first in the lungs. But the, but the, the air does pass through the lung to get into the air sac. Yeah, but in big canals and then when it goes out again, and then it yeah. goes for exchange of oxygen in the lungs. Yeah. We, we, we've published a few years ago uh, a paper which was held for the student, but when we inoculated fluorescent beads in all areas of the chicken, and then you can see it, it spreads everywhere. And it's the same as in okay. the pig, when you give it nasally, half of it is swallowed. Okay. And, and ends up in the intestine. And then to the question of Eric, the Hardarian gland. Yeah. How, how is that? Did you analyze the Hardarian gland? for the immune responses yeah. by intranasal vaccination, and certainly in neither of did you analyze that? Yeah, but not intranasal. We did intratracheal. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And did you see something yeah, in, yeah, in yeah, the yeah. herdarian gland? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you get antigen-specific responses in the herdarian gland. Okay. They're very, very important in the chicken. Yeah. And what is then the difference with mammals? Because is it is it that e easier it passes the barrier, the mucosa? Because that is, I mean, the, 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 is it the lining? Is it the epithelium that makes the difference? That's what we're working on now. Yeah. We don't know. Okay. Is there a lot of mucus in the lens of a chicken? I don't know, but I'm no. asking you because no. I think that is quite different, perhaps, with um, of the ruminants and of the. Mammalians. No, not in the lung itself, not yeah. in the parabronchi. No. Yeah, because the air is first going to the air sacs. I think the air sacs play. Did you find any lymphoid structures in air sacs? Yeah, tiny folds, yeah. yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Show you the pictures. <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting to, to see your papers, yeah. And then there is another question about the mouse and the other animals. Now, I would say, simplifying, that the ruminants have no nasal lymphoid yeah. tissue. Yeah, that's true, that's and what the mice know. has. Yeah. And that's therefore true. all these experiments in mice are not relevant. Yeah. And it's that true, is, it's what it's uh, all happening in the wild iris ring. Yeah. With all this yeah. lymphoid organs there and that's in fact if you look to histologists they say there is no nult in, in other species than in rodents. And even we can then go further on. Do you think when you wanna have lung protection? Okay, respiratory protection, but deep, deep uh, respiratory organs. You know, in the lungs, I'm looking also at the eye, but the lymph nodes are not so well developed in young animals. In a certain sense, the bronchiolar lymphoid tissue is only after birth developed mm -hmm. and through challenge. And if I'm correct, there, will, there is none in the beginning. And do you think when you vaccinate ruminants intranasally, like Jean-Pierre did, Jean-Pierre Scherling and all, do you think it's happening in the wild ice ring and that that is a communication for seeding, let us say, the epithelial cells of the lung with the effector cells which have been produced at the wild ice ring? Or how do you see it? Oh, well, it is interesting. The question is interesting because uh, um, um, Jean-Pierre also examined intra lung immunization and so direct, direct yeah lungs. going very deep in the lungs and then injecting the antigen in deeper lungs and he, he published that in mucosal immunity uh, his group or the people yeah, together yeah. and they can induce iga responses by injecting antigen in the deep lungs in one lobe and see them appearing in the other lobe and, and it's, for me, it's not completely clear where this is induced, because the, the, in fact, in the deep ways, you don't have lymph, lymphoid follicles. So it was, uh, uh, so you can induce, it was for me a surprise. I, I would have expected you only induce IgG responses going in the deep lungs, but he could induce nice IgA responses. He used, he used an adjuvant that is ISCOM uh, as also, in these experiments, yeah. and and perhaps that plays a role. I don't know. I don't. I don't see the mechanism. But what you say, yeah, yeah. In the pig, for instance, the the, the lymphoid tissue in the lungs is induced. In the in ruminants, I don't know. So in the pig, it isn't there, and it appears if you have an infection. In in in, in ruminants, in some species, it's there always. So uh, in pigs, it mainly occurs. You get an upregulation of, of, uh, of uh, lymphoid follicles and even the follicle associated epithelium as a result of an infection. And then perhaps, if the other people don't want that, we will continue asking questions. But I have one last one. If you inject a live vaccine by needle, you know as well a live vaccine is not vaccinating if it doesn't multiply. The dose is too low, you have to increase that dose. Now the predilection site of respiratory viruses, when you inject them into a, with the needle, is somewhere in the lungs or in the trachea. So they migrate. They don't stay there, the life. They migrate. If they don't find their cells to multiply in, they go to the lungs. Why don't you get an as good mucosal immune response by injecting a live vaccine by needle? Why do you have to go to the nasal system or to the respiratory? It's a challenging question. Eh? Because they go also, if it is a life vaccine, to their predilection places. Yep. Yeah, the only thing I can think of is that some innate immune mechanisms are occurring first and, and will prevent this, the same quality of mucosal infection than, than you have when you immediately reach the epithelium. If they don't multiply, they will not vaccinate. No, you. But anyway, you have. Uh, to, you, and it is blocking that. And it, and it will recognize some of the epitopes and some of the the RNA or DNA or whatever is coming free, uh, and that will activate uh, innate immune mechanisms. 
And the moment they, these mechanisms are there, if you have interferon, uh, the moment you, your replication will decrease in the mucosa. So I, I, I would think that this could interfere with the local, uh, local immunity. Yeah. Um, hello, good morning. My name is Camille Bellet. I'm working at the University of Liverpool. I have two questions. Uh, one is related to uh, efficacy uh, of, of the vaccine and the other to uh, more social acceptability. So the first one related to efficacy, I was just wondering um, um, either if you take uh, the, the process of breed selection that has impacts in bird, for example, of the length of your intestinal tract, or if you take um, situations where you would have co-infections of, of, you know, parasites infections in sheep, and you would uh, provide the vaccine. Could you could you comment on how it would impact on your vaccine efficacy and uh, actually on the quality of? of it's the a tool? very complex question, you know. Yeah. <laughs> With know. probably it will really depend on what what is is interfering at that moment. Because each, uh, you know, the outcome of an immune response is is adding all the stones of what is happening at, at a certain moment together, and if you have a parasite which activates a T helper one response, and you come with a bacteria that needs a T helper two response, this will influence each other anyway. So that 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 the outcome is always the sum, the sum, perhaps not the sum, but, but it's a result of the interaction of all these components together. And so it will really, you cannot give one mechanism for one situation. You have to, it's like, like we know if you vaccinate and you make a new vaccine and you have the adjuvant is the same and you put in another antigen, you, you're not sure the immune response will be the same because the antigen stimulates different mechanisms. So have you ever introduced that? No, no, the, the only, no, we didn't do that. Uh, you know, it's already complicated with one. But, but it's important <laughs> to stay here at the same induction place. Yeah, yeah. You can get easily two different immune reactions opposing if you go left and right. But you're talking about the same place of induction, the same lymph node. Then but even then... Interfering. Yeah, it's but, there but even yeah, and all even then, uh, and, and Bruno probably remembers we, we, we did in the PIC the experiment with uh, the Fimbria antigen, which is a, a very potent antigen. Ten microgram is enough to induce huge antibody responses, uh, and we injected at the, the other side in in the hind leg that was E. van der Stede who did this experiment of albumin. And after one immunization, you found, found all the ovalbumin-specific antibody-secreting cells at the side of F4, and not at the side of o o where ovalbumin was injected, because the inflammatory signal probably was stronger at that side, and the homing receptors yeah, were stronger, so they, they move and they home to the side where you have the okay. expression. So even then, you can have influences. It's not always occurring, but this, is, this was an extreme example of ovalbumin, which I call a very bad antigen, which is often used as a model, but it's a very bad model, you know. And then you have the, 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 the real fimbrial antigen, which is a potent antigen, and what it is inducing locally has an influence on the homing, homing process that is occurring in the animal. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Just the second question was uh, very quick. Um, about So you talked about fish and the fact that for fish vaccination you would put the, uh, you would vaccinate putting the uh, product in the water. Um, given you have a lot of fish production systems where you have the water actually uh, of the fish um, that are red are part of other wider water, is there any risk of, of you know, a transmission of uh, to I think they, they have to do that in a sort of co contained environment. I think you cannot, you cannot do it in, in the sea. You have to put them in a contained and then wait until the vaccination, yeah, they've taken up the antigen. So it would be adapted to specific types of production yeah. systems? Uh, 
I'm, I'm Sabine Riffold and I'm working at uh, Juan Josas INRA. And I have one question on skin vaccination because epicutaneous vaccination, transdermal vaccination can be very efficient to generate mucosal immune responses. In, so in which well, animal? Well, in my experience, it, in, in my yes. Bad. But it was mentioned in, in one on, on, of your slides too that transdermal allows to reach different mucosal sites. So, I mean, do you, we know anything about mechanisms, immune mechanisms for that? Or do you know if uh, really skin vaccination could be a good way? Well, we tried it, uh, we tried it in the pick uh, and we couldn't do it anyway. In, in the, we, we, we tried to reproduce these mice vaccinations in, in a pick. It doesn't work in a pick. Um, so there are, there are other, other factors involved. And in the mice, indeed, uh, it, it works. So, um, it, it, yeah, it, the, the mechanism in, in mice, I don't know if they really know it. The moment we were studying that, they thought that, uh, uh, that the, there was a switch occurring in the, the, the dendritic cell phenotype. And they, at a certain moment, they, they claimed that the dendritic cell was migrating to the mucosa, homing to the mucosa, and there in, in, induced the, the local immune responses. But we tried it in, in pigs. It didn't work in pigs anyway. Um, it doesn't mean it, it, it will not work. I think we have to be aware that, that perhaps other species could be candidates. And, and uh, for me, it's, for instance, intriguing that uh, dogs with IgA deficiency develop easily pioderma. So in dogs, there must be something, IgA must play a role in, in the skin. And that is really something I think is worth looking at. But in a pig and also in, in, in ruminants, I don't think it will work. And I don't mean that if you vaccinate a ruminant in the skin, you won't have an effect on the intestinal mucosal because this, the ruminant is again another species. And, and in, in, in the gut and ruminants, IgG1 is 50% of the immunoglobulin. So there is a link between the systemic immune system and the intestine in pigs that is different than it is in, 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 in pigs. But I, I, don't, I don't believe it is there in humans either, you know. Uh, I've seen, I go to these mucosal immunology conferences and I see all these experiments which they use LT patches on the skin. And each time I ask, did you see IgA? And did you see that it really locates in the intestine? And they never have given me an answer, you know, never. So I really, uh, they, see, they see IgA, probably systemically induced IgA, and they see uh, IgG, strongly IgG responses, and there is an effect as long as you look within the time frame of the IgA response in the blood. But if there is memory locally, if there, uh, nobody has shown me any clear evidence that it is. So I don't is think. Is it dimeric or monomeric? Uh, they don't, you know, that's because all. You could explain that. It's so it vague, and that means that they, perhaps they investigated it, and they've seen that it's not what they really want to see and they don't tell it, or they, it is not there, you know. I'm not convinced, and I, I think you have to be careful. The mice, it, there is something different than with, with the other species. Good question, because... Uh, Edwin Kent University. Eric, you showed us that there's hardly any common mucosal immune system in humans and that it's limited also in pigs. What about ruminants? For example, if I want to induce mucosal immunity in the small intestine of a cow, I have a problem with oral. What about intranasal? I think that, that is, you know, again, something that is worth investigating. It means everybody I ask who works on ruminants and I say, and what is the effect in the intestine? they cannot answer me because they look in, in, the, in the respiratory tract and a few people seems to look also at the intestine. So how the, the homing is, the interaction is from, 
the, the respiratory immune system to the intestine in ruminants, that is not clear for me. But I, if, you, if you think logically, I would suppose there must be something, you know, in this region, in the tonsils or whatever, that, that uh, of which the gut learns to, to, to watch pathogens it has to conquer. Because uh, you, you, you have this ruminant that kills a lot of these antigens, some can pass, but a lot of the antigens are destroyed. So the, the, the learning in the gut is less developed than it is in the pig. And that's why you have this 50% this IgG1, IgA responses. And IgA in the milk of ruminants is not the most important uh, antibody, it's IgG1. And so you, 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 you see the information must come from another side and probably this is the best candidate as far as I know. But I don't know any study that, that, that went into that. So um, I'm Bill Goldie from the Morton Institute. Um, I just wanted to clarify, you keep talking about mucosal immunity. I'm assuming you're talking about IgA production. Yeah. Have you looked at cellular mucosal immunity in, we, we, in we, these situations? Yeah, we, 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 have, we look at T cell responses and look at... Uh, at uh, but this is really, it's still a puzzle in my mind. I don't know how, how I have to to put this together. And IgA is a very clear uh, clear thing in my mind, and especially in the models we work in. If you have IgA, there is protection. And of course, T cell plays a role, but um, um, I don't know how much, and, and perhaps Linda will, will talk about the viral infections uh, and, 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 and tell more about uh, the T cell response. But in the models we work, yeah, you have the T helper responses, but, but T helper is yeah, so uh, yeah. we needed the immune yeah. response with interferon yeah. yeah, production yeah. and yeah. all. But that we looked at. Yeah, yeah. We looked at the redistribution of the effector cells in yeah. the in the intestinal cells and all. We looked at all these aspects. But it's but a little the, bit different when you go to the CD8 because it's yeah. a very more difficult thing. Although you have markers and all such things, you could look at that as well. But doing bioassays and all to say definitely. But that, that the, so the, the uh, yeah the helper cells of course they are they are needed there. But what we didn't do and the, the, because the, the the tools were not available that is dissecting all these T helper cells in its different populations in the beginning. But you have you have T helper one main, uh, T helper two mainly T helper two. Uh, you have T rec and you have T helper seventeen in the models we work, which are very important. Uh, in, in the immune response. So in the e tech infection, the IL-17 response is there within 14 hours. So it cannot be the helper 17, it must be in it, IL-17. Where are you isolating those cells from? Are they from the malt mm. or are they from the... And we don't, we look, from... we look in the tissue and we stain. And if you look in the tissue and you stain, then you see IL-17 occurring after four hours. And, uh, and, and then after f four days, you see IL-17 CD4 positive cells appearing. So the T helper cells are appearing. But they come later than the, the actual IL-17 responses is there. Uh, so probably in it, immune mechanisms are the first one. And then the T helper cell populations take, take over. I but we have to uh, yeah, so, yeah. So we have coffee break right now. Thanks a lot.